Thanks for listening to Star Lores. If you like the show, please consider subscribing and giving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help us make more great content by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com. We would also love to hear from you on social media. You can follow Star Lores on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Enjoy the show, and may the Force be with you. You are listening to the Star Lores Podcast. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. The Star Wars galaxy is full of political intrigue. On the heels of this intrigue comes war, fought on the galactic scale. These wars, and the political gamesmanship undertaken by such leaders as Prince Sejor, Emperor Palpatine, B.L. Octavius, and Leia Organa, is made possible only by faster-than-light travel. This fast transportation condenses the galaxy into a region which can be navigated within months rather than eons. Faster than light travel is the heart of THE Star Wars. The politics of this universe cannot be understood without an appreciation of the scale and shape of the galaxy. To discuss Star Wars without mentioning the approximate size and shape of the galaxy is like trying to understand World War II without knowing the approximate size and shape Europe and its states. Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn stated that most stars support planets with life. Extrapolating from this premise, life in the Star Wars galaxy is extremely abundant, as are civilizations. In fact, there may be billions of distinct sentient species, since there could be as many as 100 billion stars in an average spiral galaxy. We know Star Wars takes place in a spiral galaxy based on occasional graphical representations of it in various in-universe settings. Spiral galaxies are the most common galaxy morph in the observable universe. They contain a bright bulge in their center, which contains a much higher density of stars than is found in the disk and halo. The halo region of the galaxy is wild space. This region is largely unexplored by any known civilization. It is beyond the edge of the map, in other words. It is a place where dragons be. Galactic halos contain a lot of interstellar gas and possibly dark matter. Relative to the rest of the galaxy, this area has a low density of stars. Beyond wild space lies a grand void of unimaginable scope between galaxies, and beyond the void come horrifying creatures such as the Yazong Bong. Moving towards the core, but still hundreds of thousands of light years away, the next layer of the galactic onion are the unknown regions. They have been mapped, but not extensively explored or colonized. Anybody possessing hyperdrive technology could presumably travel to worlds in this region, but they would have no idea what might await them. The outer circumference around the galaxy, at the edges of the spiral arms, form the region called the Outer Rim Territories. This region has many rugged, uncolonized, or frontier worlds, and frequently serves as a refuge for people who find themselves persecuted, exiled, and abandoned. Notable Outer Rim worlds include Tatooine, Ryloth, and Mandalore. Out here, the rule of law has traditionally been less effective than in more central regions of the galaxy, and many planets are sparsely inhabited by sentient creatures. It is the brutal, merciless, and violent frontier of the galaxy. The 
rotating disk of stars coalesce into beautiful spiral arms that contain gas clouds which can form into new stars, all orbiting a central mass in the center of the galaxy, likely a supermassive black hole. It is in this region of the galaxy that we approach the mid and outer rims. At some point prior to 36,000 BBY, a small number of species began to use interstellar travel and charted the major safe hyperlanes, thus connecting many worlds in an unprecedented manner. Distinct cultures communicated, mixed and fought on an unparalleled scale, and the unique political landscape of the Star Wars universe was born. The midrim region of the galaxy encompasses the section of the galactic disk adjacent to the bright and massive deep core. It contains such important worlds such as Kashyyyk, Malastare, Sullust, Rhodia, Naboo, Ando, Trandosha, and Nalhutta. Many civilizations here have had a contentious and bitter relationship with the Republic. The world of Uba was even the victim of what can only be called a war crime on the part of the Republic when they bombed all life on the world into extinction and the Aqualish of Ando warred with the Republic after first contact. Around 20,000 BBY, cultures from the Deep Core colonized worlds here during the Great Manifest period. Until a relatively recent point in galactic history, this region was the galactic frontier. It was a refuge for the likes of space pirates and Hutti's criminal organizations. Life, and thus political groups and civilizations, first started in the deep core on worlds like Tython, Goroth Prime, and Coruscant. Tython was the ancient home of the Jedi, a culture composed of many different alien species which preceded the Jedi Order. Goroth Prime is the world where life in the galaxy first emerged. Coruscant is the planet on which humans first evolved. Conversely, the further out from the core of the galaxy, the fewer inhabited worlds there are, and the more porous the, the, the degree of political organization. It is hyperlanes like the Corellian Run and the Hydean Way which run from the edges of wild space through the core and out the other side which facilitated galactic tr trade and travel. A reliable mechanism of faster than light travel between star systems created a galactic setting in which empires and sprawling metropolitan democracies are born and die, locked in a struggle against one another in unending millennia spanning cycles. The second great cornerstone of galactic politics are force users. Much or even most of the conflict seen in Star Wars involves force users to some extent. The wielders of this mysterious power inev inevitably find themselves caught in galactic affairs as arbiters of destiny time and time again. An example of force user influencing the political history of the galaxy is Sheev Palpatine, the Republic Senator who would go on to become Emperor. Other notable force sensitive political actors include Leia Organa, Revan, Master Yoda, Alima, and Satal Kido, to name only a few. Politics is simply the continuation of war by other means. Manned allure. The politics of the galaxy in Star Wars, like contemporary politics, bear the influence of colonialism. The earliest galaxy-spanning civilizations, such as the Rakatan Infinite Empire, used the unprecedented speed provided by Infinity Gates to expand their territory. In this expansion, the Rakatans colonized and enslaved the people of countless worlds, harvested their force energy, and stole their natural resources. For millennia, these reptilian hulks dominated, enslaved, and literally consumed countless aliens and worlds like an intergalactic locust swarm, not to mention each other. 
This motif is repeated many times throughout galactic history by the Sith Empire, the Zygerian Empire, the Yuuzhong Vong, and the Galactic Empire. An important consideration in empire building, both in our world and the Star Wars universe, is slavery. This phenomena is broad and begins early, approximately 36,000 BBY with the Rakatans, and continue, continues in virtually every galactic empire that arises in the Star Wars universe. This politics thing, it's all just a racket, right? Marn Hieroglyph. The Zygerian Empire, based out of the Outer Rim, was built almost entirely on the slave trade, eventually attracting the scorn of the Old Republic and the intervention of the Jedi. The Jedi liberated many of the slaves under Zygerian control, though the Old Republic and the Jedi were not able to abolish slavery from the galaxy entirely. There have always been individual worlds, empires, and regions where the slave trade flourished, even during the halcyon days of the Old Republic. Crime syndicates such as Black Sun, or those run by the Huts have always managed to keep the trade in sentient species thriving, especially on the more anarchic, sparsely populated worlds of the Outer Rim. Some swaths of the Outer Rim are known as Hut Space, such as the domination of these slime-covered creatures over the colonies there. The Republic in most incarnations has been ineffective in policing here. These planets have brutal histories and merciless traditions. Since the Galactic Empire was ostensibly an outgrowth of the Republic, slavery was initially illegal by their laws. However, all of the Republic's anti-slavery laws were eventually repealed or vitiated in unenforceable regions such as hut space, and some species would be classified as non-sentient in order to make moral their enslavement. It is interesting that the Empire required moral justification in order to enslave others, indicating that perhaps the motivations of individuals within the Empire were not as monolithic as the Empire might try to convey. It would be more in keeping with the Sith political doctrines that underpin the Empire's political philosophy that any individual too weak to resist slavery deserves its shackles, sentience notwithstanding. Much of the Republic's war efforts after the Battle of Endor focused on slave reparations and the liberation of enslaved Wookiees. The efforts on Kashyyyk were undertaken largely thanks to Han Solo and Chewbacca, and these rebellion heroes would be, go on to become important leaders in the New Republic. Spice is a psychoactive substance and major drug of abuse and recreation throughout the galaxy and is commonly prohibited by governments. It is often closely tied to the illicit activities carried on by criminally exploitative organizations. The planet Kessel was a major source of spice and was mined in large part by enslaved Wookiees who often met their death by overwork in its mines. Other notable spice mine locations include the moons of Naboo and the Twi'lek homeworld Ryloth. The use of spice is frequently outlawed by governments. The consequences of its use and possession range from imprisonment to losing a military position and even death. As is often the case with the prohibition of psychoactive chemicals, its illegal status drives its value up artificially making rich those brazen enough to trade in it, like infamous crime lord Jabba the Hutt. The empires that rise and stay in power do so on the basis of military domination focused on powerful weapons of mass destruction. These machines of war often have the capability of destroying entire worlds. Revan's Sith Empire used the Starforge to create its massive space navy, which brought the Old Republic to the brink of dissolution in 3963 BBY. The Galactic Empire made use of the Death Star, a moon-sized battle station armed with a super laser powered by kyber crystals. Alderaan, a core world of political significance, was the only planet ever destroyed by the Death Star. In an attempt to resurrect the Galactic Emperor, Empire, Emperor Palpatine, in a cloned body, had the massive new Eclipse-class Star Destroyer built. This titanic ship had its own less powerful version of a super laser, 
but which could still effectively destroy most worlds, but not as completely as the Death Star's laser. At the same time, the remnants of the Galactic Empire also developed the World Devastators, massive machines which could quickly turn a planet's resources into new vehicles of war, both crushing enemies and creating more tools with which to crush. A final Imperial weapon of war is the Sun Crusher, capable of destroying entire stars and virtually indestructible. Though built by Imperials, a Jedi acolyte of Luke Skywalker's was the only person to ever use the super weapon. Galactic civilization is ever caught in an ebb and flow between democracy and autocracy. As one style of government loses ground, or stars, as it were, the other gains. Eventually, as the political tide on either side are even, war breaks out. One government side wins out, and the cycle repeats, often violently, as is the case with the Jedi Civil War or the Galactic Civil War. After the Galactic Empire was toppled by its terroristic anathema, the Rebel Alliance, the democracy-autocracy tension continued. This is the case in both the Legends and Canon timelines in the form of remnants of the Empire and powerful moths vying to occupy the power vacuum left by the death of the Emperor. The galactic political entity known by various permutations of Republic has been the dominant form of political organization in the galaxy for thousands of years. It has gone through three distinct phases and the extent to which it exercises the powers of government over planets varies widely. Broadly speaking, member worlds of the Republic appoint representatives as senators on a capital world, and these senators convene to pass legislation and take actions which affect member worlds of the Republic. The first phase of galactic democracy is known as the Old Republic and dates from at least 12,000 BBY. After a series of devastating conflicts with the Mandalorian, Sigerian, and Sith empires, the Old Republic reformed as the Galactic Republic, starting the second phase of the Republic. The Galactic Republic phase saw a period of relative peace, which lasted from 1000 BBY to around 22 BBY, when the Clone Wars began. The Galactic Republic was then transformed by Palpatine's massive political reforms into the Galactic Empire in 19 BBY, which would itself be overthrown during the Galactic Civil War. In the economic growth and peace of its 1,000-year history, the Republic had become inefficient in maintaining order, and many of its senators were corrupted by simple vice and greed, or by more sinister powers like the dark side of the Force. Additionally, growing corporate interests began to usurp democratic principles, and senators would sacrifice the interests of their own constituents for their own personal benefit or ignore the pressing local issues at the expense of the broader political ambience. And so the Republic fell, or rather was engineered to fall, and was replaced by the Galactic Empire. The Galactic Republic was a representative government. Individual worlds were represented by senators, appointed by whatever means a given planet chose to appoint their officials. The governments of the worlds that participated in the Senate need not themselves be democracies in order to gain membership in the Galactic Senate. Princess Leia and her mother, Queen Amidala, for example, were royalty from their respective worlds and were referred to by the appropriate honorifics. In the Senate, however, their power was not that of a monarch. Their power shared by all senators was in their individual votes for the Senate's actions and in their aptitude for political guile and gamesmanship. The Rebel Alliance began the third phase as the New Republic as the dominant form of galactic government and for ABY. The New Republic moved their capital from Coruscant, perhaps to distance itself from the Galactic Empire's highly centralized governmental style, and prevent the rise of future dictatorships. The capital thereafter rotated, based on the homeworlds of its senators. It never reached the galaxy-spanning size and power of its predecessor, though this was likely by design, rather than a failure to emulate their predecessor. In order to ensure the security the Republic will be reorganized into the first Galactic Empire for a safe and secure world.
The Galactic Empire formed from the corpus of the Galactic Republic. Like the Republic that preceded it, the Empire made the core world of Coruscant its capital. Executive power in the Empire was focused in Emperor Palpatine. As such, his death at the Battle of Endor hailed the hegemony's decay as various moths, admirals, and others vied for power in the crumbling Star Empire's leadership. The Galactic Empire was organized in three primary tiers. The first is the Imperial Ruling Council, led by Emperor Palpatine, and staffed by Grand Vizier Mas Amida and other important Imperials. The second tier contains the Imperial Moths, who functioned as governors of sectors of the galaxy, presumably encompassing trillions of citizens. Finally, there is the military tier of imperial government, which carries out the bidding of the Moths, imposing totalitarian rule over the galaxy. The Imperials exercise power through violence rather than consensus. This simpler organization and decision process facilitated greater security, efficiency, safety, and peace on a galactic scale, according to Palpatine's propaganda machine. The fact that the Empire engendered violent rebellion and lasted only a couple decades compared to the millennium of the Galactic Republic indicates that this streamlined authoritarian government does not lead to a safer, more peaceful society. The apparent eternal struggle between galactic empires and republics is mirrored by the struggle between those who subscribe to certain philosophical and spiritual interpretations of the Force. The two easiest categories to examine are that of the Sith and the Jedi. The various galactic republics have owed their success in large part to the Jedi, while the empires have owed their success to the Sith. The Infinite Empire, though not necessarily Sith, shared an obsession with the dark side of the Force and the power that it gave them. It was an important ingredient in the eventual formation of the political doctrines and horrific force powers of the Sith Empire. Galactic theocracies have periodically risen in the galaxy. In 11,000 BBY, the Old Republic was turned to such a state, with the ascendance of Supreme Chancellor Contispex I, a member of the Pious Day faith. Contispex initiated a centuries-long period of crusade and conquest by the Republic. Eventually, a descendant of Contispex was arrested and removed from his post as Chancellor by the Jedi Master, Bale Duck Davis. The Jedi withdrew again from politics once the Old Republic had recovered from the damage inflicted by the Pious Day era. In 5000 BBY, Naga Sadao led the first of several Sith galactic states. Each time a Sith-led state is emerged, a galactic war has followed, with the power-obsessed Sith usually being the instigators of such conflicts. The Jedi reached their zenith during the Great Peace of the Galactic Republic while the Sith experienced their largest success millennia earlier as a Sith Empire, and later in the similar Galactic Empire, though by a slightly different underlying political philosophy. The Sith of the Galactic Empire, namely Darth Vader and Sidious, practiced a political strategy called the Rule of Two. In this system, there are only ever two Sith, a powerful master and an avatar of Sith power, and an envious apprentice, and it was expected that the apprentice eventually overthrows the master. In this way, power is greatly consolidated in individual Sith, and the infighting that made the previous Sith Empire so unstable and short-lived could be avoided. In contrast, Darth Krat abolished the Rule of Two and reformed it to the Rule of One. Power is consolidated in one master who dominates all other Sith, who swear obeisance to their master. The Force in military terms is a massive force multiplier on par at times with super weapons. One Dark Lord of the Sith in battle is like an entire battalion of more or more of troops, and by eliminating all or most other Force users, power is much easier to maintain. The Force itself can even be used as a superweapon, as when Darth Nihilus massacred the world of Qatar, when Negasado manipulated the plasma for, from two suns to destroy his enemies, or when Basila Shan began to turn the tide of the Jedi Civil War 
in the Republic's favor through the battle meditation. The Sith tend to usurp existing power structures and exercise political influence through real politic, their only political ideals being the consol consolidation of power. In contrast, the Jedi have, at times, tried to be apolitical by practicing an ascetic and spiritual lifestyle, removed in theory from galactic politics and engaging in violence only in self-defense or in the defense of those who are the victims of aggression, regardless of political creed, though their self-appointed position as the de facto guardians of the Republic had been inherently political metastance that would later force them to act or not act as conflicts dictated. Though they tried to maintain their position as neutral arbitrators rather than enforcers of galactic policy, though in practice this did not always occur. At the beginning of the Pious Day era, they completely broke contact with the Old Republic due to its reprehensibly aggressive behavior. After restoring the Old Republic, the Jedi willingly ceded their political influence gained from having Grand Master Bail Dictavius serve as Grand Chancellor to the standard operating procedures of a democracy. Invariably, as a galaxy is thrown into chaos and bloodshed, the Jedi find themselves lending their considerable powers to the Republic, as the ideals of the Republic have traditionally aligned with those of the Jedi, who have at times gone so far as to swear to defend the Republic. The Jedi made good on their oath during the Mandalorian Wars, the Hyperspace Wars, the Jedi Civil War, and others, often finding their order much scarred by the experience. Though swearing itself to upholding the Republic and peace, the Jedi Order has inadvertently created circumstances which have spoiled both. For example, Darth Vader and Darth Revan, two of the most powerful users of the dark side to ever exist, were trained, created, in effect, by the Jedi Order prior to succumbing to the temptations of the dark side. The Sith themselves, primordial adversaries of the Jedi, are in fact Jedi descendants. The experiments in dark side alchemy and forerunners of the later Sith empires were members of the Jedi Order before being exiled for heresy. It is the very act of this exile which caused followers of the Sith philosophy to engage in empire building in the first place. Astropolitics. We ready to kick this conversation off, guys? Yeah, let's do it. So, did uh, that episode make sense? Does uh, the galaxy, do you feel like you know where you are when we talk about Corazon and Tatooine and the outer rim, mid rim, all those things? Yeah, I think um, it, it's a lot of dense material. So we're really trying to, to sum it up to, to get like a get our bearings in the universe but yeah. i think we're just getting started into it yeah um, it's definitely it is interesting because it's like a, it's more of like a history of intergalactic civilization like when once civilizations start interacting with one another um but even still it's like the history of the actual galaxy would hypothetically be millions of years right billions of years yeah and who knows like what came before that is that i don't yeah. even know if there's any and that, source material for knowing that well there is there is mention and i didn't do this research this was a christian but at, at some point in star wars lore they do met is it goroth prime yeah is, is that is that where the life origin of life of yeah, all yeah, life, yeah yeah or is it the origin of life or is it just the place where life first evolved in the galaxy would it be evolve? the same thing? No, because it could evolve. Could it, yeah, it could, it could start on another planet it, yeah. as well, like the same process. Especially, especially just later. With what we know about biology now, that if you have a galaxy with aliens, yeah. you would definitely have aliens on all kinds of different... And I mean, we'll get into this on the xenobiology, but I mean, the whole idea that all all the creatures in Star Wars seem relatively the same and like animals that you might find in the natural world. Yeah with some exceptions, it's a little bit strange because like the idea that DNA is the basis of life is sort of random. There are, I mean, I'm sort of going out on a limb because I haven't done any close reading on this or anything, but there are theoretical constructs of other molecule chains like DNA that, that could work in the same way in terms of building life, self-replicating life that also changes and would be responsive to uh, 
the pressures of evolution like humans. So it, it's weird that in a galaxy where maybe life probably evolved spontaneously a bunch of different times that it looks to us at least like it's still all based on DNA, especially with how much crossbreeding uh, we see that happens between species. Like there, if there are carbon based aliens out there there's no way a carbon-based alien is going to be able to mate with a dna based yeah, yeah. alien right those two systems are just not going to be compatible but uh we'll get into that on our xenobiology i, I, I do episode. wonder though is it possible that some species could just be like lo- long lost descendants of other species seeding other planets kind of thing yeah i don't know if there's any like source material on that there's an element of that later on with the uh um, I forget. I think they're called the Eternals. Um, okay. But they're a race that starts to seed life across the galaxy. So that could be a, a, oh, an example okay. of why there's some similarities. Yeah. But I'm also not opposed to the life starting independently, like you were saying, and n- not being compatible. We just, you know, we haven't looked deep enough into all the different races yet. But yeah. When we do, and there are, there are down, some really fantastical aliens that you don't get any whiff of in um, the movies that appear in like, yeah, yeah. like the graphic novels and the that, well that's the thing that there's such a diversity of yeah of sentient species within the star wars universe but, it, it's like uh, it would be hard to imagine even if we did have aliens in our galaxy it would be hard to imagine th- that diversity maybe there is maybe i'm just like thinking too small because i know obviously it's hard to comprehend the gal how big the galaxy actually is but but I think, still i think um and I wanted to say this for xenobiology, but this is the w- direction uh, the conversation is going. So do you guys know what the Drake equation is? Yeah. 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 So you yeah, explain it just for the audience. So, so the Drake equation and I'm, I'm really horrible at math. <laughs> so excuse me. The, the broad points of it, though, are it's just an equation that sort of figures out how likely it is that life can evolve on a given planet. And what we use for the variables in that are life on our planet, right? And so then you just extrapolate. So it's like, yep. okay. How many stars in the so, galaxy? How many viable planets? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's, say, let's say for the sake of argument that life can only evolve on a planet like Earth. And then you just apply that equation. Well, how many stars are there? that are like our sun turns out there's a lot because it's part what's called a main sequence star and it's one of the most populous forms of stars and there's i don't know millions or billions of those in our galaxy alone right and and then the drake equation keeps changing when we learn about the population of planets like most most stars have at least a gas giant most of those gas giants got at least a couple moons so then you just keep applying the math yeah. To see how it works. But yeah, bas- essentially based on the Drake equation, it's like sort of the idea is that it's inevitable that there would be other life in the galaxy. And, it, you know, n- not just in our galaxy, but in many different galaxies. Like it's not a, a matter of if, it's a matter of sort of when. Yeah. You know, like that's sort of the idea of the drake equation and then and then through the drake equation we get to this other idea which we were t- sort of talking about and it has to do with like species like the eternals that both seed and then other species kind of like spoiler alerts for mass effect <laughs> that uh come and destroy and destroy everything yeah. right come and reap so to speak yeah <laughs> so they're like the we call that the the great filter is the the term they talk yeah. about it so there's something Because when you do math on the Drake equation, we do seem to be suspiciously empty. Like there's been enough time on enough exoplanets like Earth that we should have seen something. By now, there would be, even without light speed travel, it's theoretically possible that there could have been many galaxy spanning civilizations by yeah, now yeah. And, and we obviously don't see that though yeah, yeah it's maybe not the, uh, our galaxy yeah it's, it's called the fermi paradox the fermi paradox yeah, yeah. that's where i was trying to where get like to. because of the drake equation how prolific life is supposed to be yeah we don't I, see it i we think fermi to... was a buddy of drake too i think they oh, worked really? in like a lab <laughs> together <laughs> well if you got to be famous that's, make friends with famous that might be people. a pro apocryphal but i really love stories of like scientists who just bust each other's ball <laughs> <laughs> oh i shouldn't say that <laughs> Yeah, but going back to like um, sort of galactic history, um, another 
theory that I've sort of wondered about Star Wars is could life have been started by the Force? Could yeah. the Force have had something to do with I was actually going to gonna bring that, that up. seems to be the implication. I yeah, think. there is a, a mystical element of it. And yeah. they t- talk about the Force and the wellspring of life, if you recall from our Force episode. Yeah, yeah, that's specifically what I'm thinking of. Yeah, like, and that, it, Does Yoda even refer to it as that or something? I'm thinking of some sort of movie quote. Spe- sp- well, specifically because the... Uh, um, what it quite gone he says the the force is in all living beings it, it's almost like the force is sort of quote unquote they're kind of like dna if you will it's like yeah. that the the sort of building block it's almost like this allusion to a building block of life uh that's just a theory i'm not saying that that's necessarily the case but it does it to me it seems plausible within the world that that the force sort of started in chaos and and created order you know out of the natural elements so and yeah the other thing about it too is the uh the idea of the metachlorians because they find these metachlorians across multiple species in the blood of yeah and that that, that, as you're saying that i wondered that too like because yoda yoda says that the force is in all things all yeah. things rock so does that mean that there are metachlorians in rocks and sand and trees right are there are there many chlorines in everything i think the direct quote is actually in the living things so things like rocks and things i don't think but i think he specifically refers to a rock though i think qui-gon in the movie no i'm pretty sure someone can fact check us on this but i'm pretty sure qui-gon said all living things yeah and perhaps yoda said uh, and by that extension yes things like plants would probably have metachlorines in them but things like rocks i don't think i think inert objects don't necessarily have a force connection but then that's where you kind of what about like the all, the ancient sith empire guys though right like they they specifically imbued inanimate objects sure i think you can do that as an external property but, but it's then not why, intrinsic to those but why wouldn't the things? force be able to do that on its own then without a person you know what i mean yeah sure, but, 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 but humans or like, not human sentience can manipulate the force in all sorts of ways right, that were never intervene. used prior to existence right the same way we can breed things they didn't happen naturally but we're we're imposing our will let's say on genes same way the sith kind of impose themselves on metachlorians or the force and and, and the manipulation of it yeah that would be my thought so the other thing about uh astropolitics astrogeography as we're calling it here is the sort of diffusion of organization and civilization so going out from the core, the core worlds are the oldest worlds, right? So they have had the longest time to develop galaxy-spanning civilizations. And you see that with like Corazon's a core world. That's where humans come from. Humans have obviously done well for themselves in this galaxy. They're everywhere. Yeah, they're pretty they've, prominent. They've been the, uh, the what, what would you call it? The head of many different galactic civilizations. They've, they've yeah. sort of been at the helm. And... Uh, there are there are lots of other core worlds that I'm just blanking on that were there's places like Alderaan, Alderaan and um, Corellia too. Yeah, Corellia. They, they did a lot with uh, hyperspace, like thousands of years. Before. Yeah, they were one of the, the. They were one of the pioneers, and that's another core world. Yeah. Is Kashik a core? No, no, Kashik is fringe. I think. And that that's the thing I noticed. Just a little <laughs> thing is it's funny that at least as the stories are represented in Star Wars lore with what I'm familiar with. Obviously, there's so much of it that no one person can have it all in their head. But it really seems like mid-rim worlds just kind of get ignored <laughs> in uh, storylines for the Everything most goes place. to the extremes. It's, it's, always, it's always the metropolitan Core <laughs> city the... planet world or the, the Wild, Wild West, West. Jakku yeah. or Tatooine or something or, or Dantooine. But that's where all the stories are. No like, one cares about your day-to-day life. You never have just boring cities with like <laughs> 150,000 people who are just like... Going to work and going home. They've got some industry, some pollution, but it's not that bad. <laughs> Nothing is really a global catastrophe. Everything's Nothing's very a local. global catastrophe. Yeah. <laughs> They're just doing fine. <laughs> and maybe that's like most of the galaxy. It's, it's like that. Well, we just like know. real life. You, you only hear on the news about like the war. Exactly. Exactly. And you hear about, you know, the big chaotic things, but most of us are just living our day to day. Exactly. It's just those nobles and the, those um, blue bloods in the core and those crazy people out on the in fringe, the, yeah. out the fringe causing I, trouble. I would imagine just within the universe too is like the, uh, while all these things like 
the Death Star destroying planets and and um, and the Empire falling and all this kind of huge political events. There's probably like planets in the outer rim who don't even think about it, who maybe don't maybe hear about it. Like, yeah. It's such a it's, distant it's, thing. It, it's almost like an afterthought. Like how, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm just wondering like how much of an effect does it actually have on the like a population. lot of, yeah, a yeah. lot of these populations. It, it, I think they touch on that even in the movies uh, when in tattooing um, in episode one, when they get there and they talk about like all these legislation against slavery, for example. And I believe Shmi Skywalker says like the Republic doesn't exist out here, right? Like not even their, yeah, their yeah. money doesn't even yeah. qualify out there, yeah. even though technically they yeah. fall under their, yeah. their jurisdiction. I Did suppose. Tatooine, were, were they under the jurisdiction? It's complicated because you have things like hut space that kind of intersect yeah. with mm. the kinda, political. It, what we're, we're talking about now with like their money not working really reminds me of like Europe or something. You know what I mean? Where they've got like they've got the euro, but then they've also got their individual local random currencies. local currencies, and then yeah. some countries won't take the local currency of other countries, and right. some will, and it's all very confusing. Yeah, yeah. and I imagine that times a million uh, for, for every planet. For, yeah, uh, <laughs> every planet, and also bringing this up with like people on the outer rims of the galaxy, not knowing exactly what's going on, is you wonder how much there is like kind of a monoculture that's penetrated throughout the galaxy. Like, are there, are there populated worlds in this galaxy that have civilizations on them that just haven't reached hyperspace or have, have they pretty much settled everything that, that had sentience? On no, it? I'm, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That's literally where I wanted to go next is kind of like the geopolitical aspect. Yeah, yeah. And there's like a colonial component to that we'll dive into in a sec, but mostly to stay on track with, with your question there. Um, one of the biggest things with Star Wars that I love is there is a general monoculture, but there are definitely strong... It's very diverse, though. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Like even like you take the people of the N- Naboo, for example, they have a very distinct look and style compared to the other Bad. civilizations <laughs> <laughs> whatever you may think of it but they're very embedded with the senate and with the the uh the republic right so in every planet you find this even like big like uh mishmash kind of planets like Tatooine. yeah in that, a spaceport you look around and people have that very is distinct cultural... interesting how just how distinct they are from each other too like you don't if if you go into let's say a youth hostel in a central European country like Germany or something where there's going to be a lot of people traveling there from all over the world. It's like you look at them, but they're, you, they could basically all be from the same city. Like nobody looks that different from, from each other, even in what they're wearing. You yeah. know what I mean? Like True. they're all wearing denim. They're all right. They <laughs> they've have- all got iPhones. They've all got Nike hoodies yeah but like in in the star wars universe it's as if they were would all wear their own traditional wear so imagine you walk into a hostel and someone's wearing like a cossack outfit who's like a russian and then you'll find like someone wearing a traditional polish outfit but then it's like wait a minute you guys have had hyperspace technology for like twenty thousand years (laughs) what do you mean your traditional wear you have no traditional wear so there are is it preserved it's like the nabooey and stuff that old or do people just not travel that much? It between depends planets? planet to planet. Some planet, like Coruscant, for example, probably looks nothing like Coruscant looked. Yeah. But like Coruscant would be started. such a multicultural. Is it right. Coruscant, Coruscant, or Coruscant? Coruscant. We could probably do a whole episode on how to pronounce Star Wars names. <laughs> I'm just going to say it the way do. I say it. Yeah, um, but anyways, like... Uh, and again, and I just noticed this now, we see that very on-the-nose Star Wars naming, core because it's in the galactic Oh, core. there's more of that that's going to come up much later. <laughs> Darth Vader, because he's an invader. Actually, that there's an interesting thing about the Darth Vader thing. I'm going to save it for a language episode, but it's not what you think. Vader, also a great, really fat professional wrestler from like the 80s and 90s. Well, he's, there's also an old religion called the, the Vedas. Yeah. But Vader, he was really fat, and he did backflips off the top rope, which is oh. why I liked him. Yeah. Um, and and I, Vader's also a decent death metal band. Not about Star Wars, though. Was they it better pay us for that ad. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll uh, I'm just, I'm gonna bite the bait here. So I believe it's Dutch. Vader actually means father, 
And as George oh, Lucas really? himself uh, said that he used the term. So um, he said God, Darth. It he, sounds like a good enough menacing name. Right, exactly. Yeah. He said he's Darth. He's worse than J.K. Rowling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, you'll be surprised. I'm Like I said, we're going to do a whole episode on that stuff. And it's, it's really interesting. That <laughs> etymology of Star Wars names, you're, that could be a really good episode. Yeah, and, and we like I, I want to dive into so much of it. But just to give it away, at least for this one, is yeah, Vader comes from father in Dutch. And, and essentially it's dark father is what... Lucas Darth was trying Vader. to yeah. convey with Darth Vader. <laughs> but the, the Sith naming schemes obviously start to adopt a very, like, they have uh, words that are shared. Like, yes, Vader can sound like Invader. Sidious is, like, insidious. You know, Maul yeah. is, like, a brutish weapon. Nihilist from N- Yeah, Kotar, exactly, nihilism. <laughs> so it starts to take that trend. But Lucas himself has stated what the background to Vader's name was. I do like it, though, because all the, all the Star Wars names sound great. I, think. I just think... If when you th- say that, they... They're great to say. Yeah, and that's actually another thing. <sighs> we'll save it for the etymology episode because yeah. <laughs> I, I could go on for hours about yeah. it. Um, but just before I, I uh, go there, I just wonder what it sounds like to the Dutch when they first listen to Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very on the nose, uh, all the bad guys named Father. Um, another thing, uh, I know another thing that's uh, influential within astropolitics is the spice trade. Yes. And, uh, and I was wondering... Um, if that was if Lucas had any sort of like addictions, mm-hmm. secret addictions. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, uh, so, uh, like I think, an allusion to because Frank Herbert. Yeah, Dune I, I knew exactly where you were going. Were, and Tatooine, that, hello. Uh, yeah, and I looked it up, and Dune was written in '65, so it was it pre- obviously I, predated. I think Lucas Star has gone on record and said that he he read Dune before writing, yeah. writing so it Star sort of Wars. Like an and influence. It definitely. Yeah. Influenced but, him, yeah. It, it, well, even like the the Sar- the, the, Sar- the Sarlacc pit on Tatooine, yes, the planet Tatooine. A lot of it is like is almost Dune like, you know. <laughs> it's not almost Dune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the sand people, <laughs> yeah, are, yeah, like yeah. the Fremen, right? The, yeah, there's there's a lot of these like uh, uh, very similar um, things that are, and I I love Dune too myself. Yeah. Um, but I, I haven't the read Dune the book movie, in years. Underrated. Totally underrated. Well, uh, we'll, again, for a later episode, we'll do a pop culture references one for Star Wars. And also, here's another pop culture Dune connection. Did you guys know that David Lynch was taken out to lunch by George Lucas (laughs) in his Lamborghini and Lucas wanted him to direct Empire Strikes Back? But uh, David Lynch passed on it. I don't know if you guys know David Lynch. No, who's that? He directed Dune. And he's oh, and he's okay. also he's also a famous um, horror and sort of surrealist oh, okay. movie director. He also did the Elephant Man. Oh yeah, yeah. and uh, Blue Velvet. Hmm. Um, what it, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of this show. Come Fire Walk with Me. Am I ringing any bells? No. Kyle MacLachlan's in it. Twin Peaks. No. You guys don't know Twin Peaks? Okay. Yeah, all I, I'm a, I, I'm familiar with Twin Peaks. I'm not like a he, big fan or anything. He, uh, yeah, he was the creative mind and director of oh, okay. most of the Twin Peaks. I like the original Twin Peaks. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. the new one. Oh, and the new yeah. one. Oh, okay, gotcha. And he almost directed Strikes Back. Yeah. And he almost <laughs> directed Empire Strikes Back. And he, he passed on it. That and was, he went and did Dune best, instead, basically. The best movie of them all, in yeah. my opinion. What would have happened? Yeah. Anyways, um... Go ahead, Christian. Um, I just wanted to bring back the colonial discussion. Yeah. uh, Just for a quick second. When you were mentioning earlier uh, about how, like, things are kind of centralized in the core worlds. Yeah. um, That that does reflect kind of a colonial idea of, like, Europe being the center of, like, Western civilization and things and expanding outwards and seeing everything as, like... uh, as new as they encounter right the north americas are new to us yeah, it's right? the frontier exactly but they they completely disregard like indigenous populations and the same kind of ideas in star wars where you're saying like oh you know they, they would have been the oldest cultures in the core worlds but that's not necessarily true especially yeah, I if guess life, that, that's definitely not right, true like the obviously wookies, the wookies for example like evolved on their planet they're one of the first sentient species not the first but one of the right. first earliest groups they have a fully developed culture and everything by the time they make contact with the greater galactic, um, I, I don't know what to call it, republic or civilizations. Yeah. Uh, so that's the thing is like Star Wars was always expanding and, and colonialism plays a big part in the early uh, battles of the galaxy because you have empires and like republics fighting each other 
and they also have them fighting locals and there's yeah you also have like first contact type conflicts yeah that uh, happen repeatedly repeatedly happen yeah. So just uh, just something that I wanted to touch on because you brought it up earlier. And that, that was something when I was uh, writing this, actually. I don't know if you guys have ever read Guns, Germs, and Steel. I've heard of it. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a very interesting book. It, it's, it's super good. But yeah. um, the point is that that really gives you the scale of uh, just total human annihilation that, that went on. Just, just, just this one time with us moving over to the Amer with Europeans, not us <laughs> going to the settling the Americas, like how many populations were devastated. Yeah. And I was yeah. thinking as species were developing galactic travel, this pattern that's oh, yeah. in guns, germs of, and steel would have happened thousands of times. Maybe <laughs> yeah, probably we're talking more, probably trillions more. <laughs> of people dying of like colds and just like random germs from Twi'lek. Yeah. yeah. And they're just like footnotes in, in historic, in the historical <laughs> exactly. records, right? We this entire contacted civilization a died of toe fungus <laughs> from the huts. Yeah. And they just disappeared. We don't know why. They just disappeared. <laughs> but it's free real estate. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is pretty interesting. I do wonder too, like, uh, it, it, it's probably, especially like the, so in like the original movies and like the sort of new Republic, you're, you're getting like a more of a conceptualization of sort of, uh, what do you call humanoid rights or sentient life rights? Um, uh, whereas you could imagine that throughout galactic history, there's a lot of xenophobia and basically any species that isn't you, your species is you can just like annihilate and slave and so you'd, on and so forth. You'd, you would expect that to happen, but it's surprising even as I've, I've been reading the empire comic book series, which um, does sort of all the interstitial stuff. Basically it fills in the gaps in the first trilogy. Yeah. So like all the years between a new hope and empire strikes back and empire yeah, yeah. strikes back and stuff. And so it gets a lot, obviously it's called empire into the empire and it's inner workings. And like the racism thing isn't really it doesn't that come up that often. It no, doesn't no. come up that often. Yeah. But I'm saying not in like the, like that era, but I'm saying in like eras past, is there is there not any I think we can there are examples like but genocides or Yeah, it happens. Genocide, um, yeah, but that's almost always tactical. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it, it's, it's not because they hate you because of your race. Yeah, they, it's not we they hate want you because of your race. Planet you're, just, or your... you're just in the way. <laughs> or you yeah. made Vader mad. <laughs> so Fair he's gotta enough. blow you up. Yeah. There is uh there are elements of xenophobia that come up intermittently and things of like uh like you have the crusade eras during the early Galactic Republic. But, but was that even xenophobia or was that just, no, it was straight up xenophobic. Oh, yeah. oh, it was. And like then you have humans elements. against and everybody. the Mandalorian. Yes. The Mandalorians are pretty z- xenophobic. They're not they? actually. They're multicultural. They are right? very multicultural. Yeah. Really? They do end up committing genocide quite frequently. Yeah, but they are surprisingly sort of again that's like just Sam was their saying, laissez faire attitude on life. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Sam, Sam was uh, was right on the nose with that. Where like they commit genocide a lot, but it was tactical. It's it not. Less, it's not based out of hate. Yeah. No, yeah. and they are very like it's a, open. It's a progressive form of genocide. The best kind. <laughs> um, we might but, be killing your whole race but we're respecting your rights <laughs> while we do it you're individuals and you have a beautiful culture <laughs> it has to go away <laughs> now um, the Empire 2 exhibits very uh, strong xenophobic senti- uh, sentiments yeah, as well yeah. so it does come up but I would say things like in the Republic I mean there's elements of other aliens and being I, racist to each other too I'm, I'm really reading it too because me and Christian have had a little bit of a debate about this in writing the episodes, but I'm trying to get like specific, specific policy details about what those xenophobic tendencies were for the empire, but they definitely had alien officers and stuff. It it doesn't seem like there was an official, no non-humans allowed. Yeah. It's not, it's, I, I, I like to kind of draw comparisons more to, uh, the southern states during like uh jim crow era where things like might have been legislated that they're not racist but they kind of were right like it maybe this or is they, the like flip they side of were, that though right it's it's not legislated but but they, but they are, are right exactly but they are in fact racist. yeah exactly so there are of course you have like admirals like thrawn just, who who achieve a certain level of like 
prestige even in their ranks despite being aliens yeah um, the empire seems just to be very human centric human centric is yeah. the way my, i would put my it. my yeah. theory is that um somebody some imperial accountant at some point as um palpatine was building his stormtrooper corps accidentally put a few extra zeros on how many sets of stormtrooper armor he <laughs> he ordered and they just had like millions of <laughs> sets of stormtrooper armor that could only fit humans <laughs> write a short story sam <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's why it was it just an account created error. the policy <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess it's only humans now <laughs> and there are even aliens that do wear stormtrooper armor they're very interesting they look very cool i and just very i just saw a comic book cover of an <laughs> yeah. alien taking off a helmet yeah you know? so so it does happen it's not exclusive but they're definitely human centric is how and, i would i mean the whole galaxy is sort of anthropocentric right like, yes definitely more human looking aliens uh, have I, i've got like a, a, yeah. a whole master's thesis uh brewing in this about evolution and why we see that which which will be really interesting but think about this even the the species who aren't necessarily humanoid they almost always have like binocular vision and a I, mouth and a nose and hands and and <laughs> I wasn't even going to say mouth and nose, but they have manip- manipulated, manipulate, manipulative appendages, right? Yeah. They have things that tentacles can, that can or, grasp. They yeah, have yeah but like even the, like the huts or some something. Have, they, they, yeah, they they have all those. Or a uh, Soto Viosk Basque is is that his name? He's from. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. <laughs> that yeah, is his name. I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> he he's sort of like a crustacean looking uh, old Jedi master from like the old Republic era. Yeah, and he has like some t- tentacles and some claws, but like right, he's right. still basically going into that anthropoid um, body plan where he's got forward facing vision and appendages and something that can make sound and speech right i'm gonna 50 50 say that's probably attributed to the uh, limitations of uh <laughs> of movie magic at the time how dare Wars you i don't even know what a movie is this is real <laughs> but yeah just like star trek right everything happens to look humanoid because it's really cheap to slap <laughs> some uh, wrinkles on someone's face and call them an alien oh my god <laughs> now now one thing and i don't know if you guys came across this in your travels one thing i'm uh I'm sort of wondering why it hasn't had like much of an influence on astral politics or galactic history is uh, is um, any kind of AI or robotic intelligence. I've been thinking about this a lot too. <laughs> yeah. Like well, why is it that that, even though it seems to be there's lots of AIs um, within the Star Wars universe, none of, the, none of them band together to make a robot army. So but, they do, actually. Okay. And yeah. do but we, that's why I'm asking it. Have you come do across Do we even yes. know that like most of the robots are, are in AIs? Fact AI. Yeah, they may not be AI so there's in a the couple strictest of, of sense. Yeah, there's a couple of... Uh, unpack there. Yeah. Um, the first thing is the nature of AI. Are they truly artificial intelligence or are they just very highly programmed right. to be... Algorithmic. You know, to appear yeah. as that, if... That was are. sort of my assumption because we... we I mean, I, I'm sure there's some arcane storyline somewhere in the Star Wars l- lore about this. But for the most part, you don't see droids really behaving like people. Almost ever. Yeah, and they do they, they do fall back on programming. They even admit to it. Right? Yeah. They say, I'm programmed for this, I'm programmed And they're perfectly that, happy to do, to do what they're things. programmed to do. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Rick and Morty with the robot. Except for like R2. <laughs> R2-D2 is probably, ironically, the most uh, human robot in the Star yeah, Wars. Despite, sentient. Yeah. Um, there are whole um, storylines that follow things like, and then we'll, again, dive into it later more in depth, but th- things like IG-88, who does gain sentience and actually right. tries and to... And Forlom as well. Yeah. And you know Forlom. And, uh, I had that action figure when I was a kid. Very <laughs> sad when my dog got, got to him. <laughs> Shoot them eaten up. by a Wookiee. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, and there's even incidences of droid rebellions um, that we'll delve into yeah. and kind of we'll unpack those questions there. But yeah. it's definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. You know, are are, it, are there ethics around treating the AI the way that they are treated in Star Wars too? Right. And circling back to our our Dune conversation, in Dune, uh, Frank Herbert handled this I think very well. Is that question would naturally come up in a property like dune where you have all this super hyper advanced technology and it's like where are the ais well there's this big thing called the bootlerian jihad in dune where there's a huge like a galaxy spanning war of humans against thinking machines and then they actually made it illegal to develop any sort of ai whatsoever so like even basic stuff computations 
they ended up creating like a whole new class of people called mentats right to uh do all of that hyperdrive but there's nothing in that in star wars that i know of but maybe this uh storyline you're I, talking I, about christian um is similar there, to the bularian yeah the, the weird thing about the uh, droid rebellions is they're very like underplayed i think yeah they, they they very they get quashed pretty quickly and they're very like localized but you would think, yes, it would be pretty devastating to have all your AI go rogue in a, in a galaxy. And this goes back to our slavery. Well, you, you would think, too, that like an AI army or civilization would be like incredibly effective and powerful. And efficient. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, it could yeah, be the limitations of programming. It could be like they are ghosts in their programming that caused these like kind of errant behaviors. Mm-hmm, and yeah. they're not necessarily... Um, operating at an optimal capacity they're just that like it, flawed that is right, something yeah. that that comes up okay periodically throughout the lore is uh wiping the memories of droids frequently to prevent uh errors right, right from yeah, yeah. For, so there is sort of a hint and again with r2 the reason he's like so defiant and has such an it's attitude he never gets his memory wiped. It's because he never gets his memory wiped <laughs> yeah what? So, so that He's developed maybe, a person. So maybe there is a potential. Yeah, but if you let that happen for long enough, could could like R two could hypothetically take over the Death Star? He could just <laughs> plug himself in and be so like. So that's literally one of the plot points. <laughs> IG eighty eight tries to hide. Yeah, he tries. He becomes he a tries Death Star. To build oh, like does a, he? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so again, well, I I hate to get too far into it because then it right. starts its own episode and stuff but we, we will get we've already we'll get I, I, was trying to, I was trying to ask just more in context of like the, actual astral politics and what, what yeah do they have like any droid on, and droid rights and things like yeah, that yeah. will definitely come and, up as a and something in our slavery back and forth me and christian have been having like why is slavery such, such a big thing when you've clearly got robots got the ability <laughs> yeah, to build yeah. some pretty sweet robots totally my theory is just that much like now robots are just prohibitively expensive and it's like robots are maybe like cars maybe your average servo droid r2 unit 3po unit yeah is like the expense of a car right like obviously lots of people have cars cars are ubiquitous on our planet but i don't think even close to the majority of human beings own a car no yeah especially if you look at population concentrations like in india and, and asia where even owning a car is just like impractical exactly so i kind of figure that that answers that part is made, but then they've been around for thousands of years. So it's you'd like, think they'd be able to scale uh, droid production. <laughs> droid uh, production. Another theory I have about that astropolitics of Star Wars, though, is it, it's about the wars thing, and this is wrapping this whole episode up in a nice little bow. But um, wars, while they can, they do stimulate a lot of innovation and economic growth. Obviously, they also have the flip side of yeah. uh, destruction and devastation and killing they're actually everybody. very destructive yeah they're actually very destructive so i, yeah. I kind of think given how many galaxy spanning wars there have been maybe like the resources just haven't been put into yeah. those kinds of technologies because they are constantly because diverted just constantly to warfare being divo- yeah. diverted to warfare and a lot of the obviously there's like the droid army and and all that stuff like where but, the droids are actually weapons of war not really not necessarily just uh servants to, yeah slaves. servants and yeah. stuff like that yeah 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 um yeah i think that's the biggest thing that i just delving into the history of it all is it's called star wars for a reason and war is definitely a central turning motive of the galaxy it comes back repeatedly often and is can be and is pretty destructive in in a lot of the of the storyline mm-hmm. but it's productive for us because it gives, gives us, us content something to take time away from our wives on a friday night (laughs) to talk about exactly well on that note uh thanks for listening may the force be with you for the emperor Thanks for listening. Don't forget to give the show a five-star rating and review. 
and give us a follow on social media. This episode was produced and edited by me, Jordan Swaim, written and directed by Christian Lutz and Sam Swaim. All original music was scored and recorded by my music project, Farewell to Shadowland.